Hello my failing movie critics in Christ, I'm Boyan and today we will be dismembering The Unholy, a 2021 horror movie that lives up to its name. But first, let us band together and help St. Herman of Alaska Church in Langley, Canada. They need to collect some… whatever this currency is, and you can be their angel in their darkest hour. I have provided the link in the description, so pause the video, go donate if you can, and then slowly have your day ruined by this review. No good deed goes unpunished. So, the unholy. Ok, so the entire film is based on the premise of Prelest. If you never had Orthodox Twitter after you, you probably don't know what it is. Miriam Webster Dictionary defines Prelest as state of being prelested. Ok, fine, Prelest is a state of spiritual delusion where, at best, we think ourselves holier than we are, and, at worst, we accept demonic visions as angelic ones. A lot of Orthodox spiritual literature is based on the concept, itself based on 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 4, even Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. One more thing, as previous dismemberments, this one will be a total spoiler of the movie. Luckily, the movie isn't exactly what you'd call subtle, so trust me, feel free to have it spoiled for you. There is a thing in art community called show don't tell. It is always better for the mystery to be experienced rather than explained away. Ah, if only the movie makers knew how to apply that. The movie begins with a witch burning scene, seen from the vantage point of the alleged witch. She is forced to wear a mask and is brutally beaten while restrained. A priest reads an exorcism over her. We know he's a priest because he's wearing a clerical collar, which will be worn by Catholics some 50 years into the future, but this priest is ahead of his time. During the exorcism, the priest beats the witch to be contained in this doll because... Well, I guess the specter needs to be let loose somehow, and you can't have her simply boiling away in hell leaving us without a movie. Then we are introduced to the protagonist of the movie, whom I'll simply call AliExpress George Clooney. Boy, we sure did see a lot of this stock character, haven't we? He's a journalist who destroyed his career by inventing fake news, he's a skeptic, but deep down he's struggling and he has a good heart. So he goes to Banfield for some silly story or another, but is called by a creepy voice to an equally ominous looking tree. He sees a quest item shine and recovers a spooky doll with a strange date on it. February 31st, 1845. Local person tells him that this is a Kern baby, and that people put them in the fields for good luck. George Clooney shatters the doll in order to associate it with a much more uneventful story, thus setting the movie plot in motion. This is what they call the evil artifact paradox. If you find an evil artifact, you have two options, to ignore it or destroy it. If you ignore it, it will corrupt anything around itself. If you destroy it, it will release something unimaginably evil to the world. You can't win. Good luck. Driving home back at night, completely wasted, George nearly runs over this creepy girl standing creepily at the road. He runs after her, ignore me, this is just me skipping movie as much as possible, and finds her kneeling in front of the tree, praying to a ghostly apparition, saying, I pledge my life to you. Remember guys, never pledge your life to some unknown otherworldly being. But you can pledge to St. Herman of Alaska Church. Come on guys, they have been through so much, they live in Canada for Pete's sakes. Anyway, as George grabs her, she faints. He takes her to a nearby priest with whom he had an argument earlier and it just so happens that he is her uncle. It turns out that the girl, Alice, was actually born deaf-mute and there was no way George could have heard the things she's been saying. Of course, Alice's physician isn't all too happy about nearly losing her ward. Dr. Natalie drives George Clooney to a nearby motel, and to this film's credit, and unlike the crucifixion I dismembered previously, this motel is proper to a small town. In the morning, he finds out that the editors have scrapped his story, but he offers to replace it with a story of a miraculous healing. Tomorrow there's a mess, and what are the odds of all the candles being lit here? Suddenly, Alice leaves the service and for no reason whatsoever, everyone starts following her. I mean, all of us Christians know there are people leaving services early, and no one really runs after them to stop them, much less the entire congregation. Be it as it may, everyone follows her to the tree and good god, what is that? Ok, remember that show don't tell? This is where there's too much of the show, and I'll be returning a lot to that part later on. Anyway, only Alice can see the… thing, and suddenly she speaks. She tells people present, in perfect English, that the lady has an urgent message and that everyone should come again to that place tomorrow. The lady calls herself Mary, but for the funsies, I'll simply be referring to her as a Mary. 
Of course, everyone is jubilant at this auspicious appearance of the Theotokos. George calls his previous editor in order to offer this new story, but she cuts him off due to his previous behavior. Oh, when will the pest stop haunting the protagonist of exorcism movies? That night he has a nightmare, and this masked thing gets out of a brook and jumps at him, in broad daylight. Again with too much of the show, when it comes to show, don't tell. Tomorrow, a boy in a wheelchair, of course you know what's going to happen next. The priest is most certainly not a fan of this much attention. Alice comes, communes with the witch tree, approaches the crippled boy, asks him if he has faith in a Mary, and of course he does, and lo and behold, he is cured. The end. Of course it's not the end, you can see that the video isn't finished yet. While everyone is praying outside, the statue of the Virgin Mary starts weeping blood. This is of no consequence, no one sees it now or after. Anyhow, the story of the healing becomes viral, with even television reporting on it. The Boston Archdiocese, the least controversial of all dioceses, takes notice of this miracle, and its archbishop, who, as you can clearly see, is bad news, gives a brief rundowns of miracles of Fatima, Lourdes, and, surprisingly, Medjugorje to the press. I need to give kudos to the actor who, while mispronouncing it, came rather close to saying Medjugorje correctly. I also find it extremely ironic that the movie that has prelates for its central theme takes Medjugorje as a good example of a Marian vision. AliExpress George Clooney comes to a correct conclusion that Benfield could become such a huge shrine. The Archbishop introduces a Monsignor sent by the Vatican who will investigate the miracle. To me he looks more like a sleazy car salesman, and the actor was cast because he previously appeared as Jesus Christ in Jesus Christ Superstar musical. I mean, is it a good thing to cast an actor as an inside joke? Anyway, the Monsignor gives a rundown of what a genuine miracle is calls himself an inquisitor and tells everyone present that he will use all signs available to him to disapprove of the miracle. Sorry, I need to take my anti-cringe pills, in the meantime, you can donate to St. Herman of Alaska Church. If you can't donate, don't worry, you can help them out through prayers and donations. On with the story. The vulture starts spamming Alice with silly questions, but she only responds to the ones asked by AliExpress George Clooney. What does the Mary want? And the answer is, our faith. He has a one-on-one -on -one with evil Archbishop who tells Clooney that Alice's uncle, the priest, had to miss out on the press conference due to him feeling unwell. Because George admits that he is a lapsed Catholic, he claims that this is an advantage, as a devout reporter could easily be accused of bias. He is therefore given the exclusive, and from that moment on only he can talk to Alice. The priest goes to the Devil Tree and finds the shattered current baby under soil. As he's checking it out, a cloaked figure arises from the ground behind the tree spread its claws and its unling on, so yeah, another pointless care. Alice has her first interview with AliExpress George Clooney, and states that the reason a Mary chose her was because Mary gives voice to the voiceless, and Alice was silent for so long, but now, when she walks into a room, everyone listens. <coughs> <Poor Alice. coughs> anyway, the priest walks in on them and states that he's not happy how things are developing, coughing all the way. If you don't know, coughing is a certain symptom of a death in movies. The priest clarifies that while the status of a shrine would be great for Benfield, it would be disastrous for Alice, and he starts listing different Catholic visionaries who suffered untimely deaths. He makes a good point in telling the journalist that Satan loves nothing more than to corrupt our faith. Another pointless care. Imagine yourself selling your soul to the devil for infernal powers, and all you do is going around stalking journalists. I think that the movie is trying to convey that hell is so boring that you'd rather stalk journalists. At the church, the Monsignor and Clooney attend Alice's rehearsal. While she sings Ave Maria, her uncle has a bad coughing fit, but Alice heals him when he confesses his faith in a Mary. His joy is quickly turned to shock as he sees the anti looming behind Alice. The Monsignor, Natalie, the Archbishop and George check out the priest's x-rays. Despite having a collapsed lung, he appears perfectly healed. This convinces everyone present that the miracles are genuine. But they're not. The miracles are officially approved, and Benfield is to become a shrine. By the way, you can totally tell that the Archbishop is an actor by the uncertain motions of the curable. If you give a chain sensor to someone who's never swung it before, it definitely shows. Ask not how I know. Alice is moved to the Archdiocese in order to protect her from intrusive news reporters. Her uncle, while smoking in the church basement, notices a draft thanks to the cigarette smoke, and in a crevice in the wall locates a strange old notebook. 
He opens it and sees a depiction of someone. Now this is strange because the image clearly depicts the witch, with mask and talons. However, that makes no sense. People never got to see the undead witch, they saw a seemingly ordinary human being. Also, it is implied that the infernal powers reveal the notebook to the priest. For what purpose? Especially because the notebook will be instrumental in the witch's defeat later on. As I will say in the upcoming dismemberment of the nun, maybe the witch isn't here because she amazed Satan with her craft, but because she is too stupid for the devil to tolerate her in hell. AliExpress George Clooney and Dr. Natalie really hit it off. During their discussion, Clooney mentions the current baby, and Dr. Natalie clarifies that they are generally used for good luck, but that dolls with impossible dates and strains on them are used to trap evil spirits. While walking, George recognizes a brook from his dream, and after another pointless jump scare, he starts suspecting that something is amiss and expresses his desire to speak with the priest. That will never happen. The priest hears a confession of a certain woman, but she proceeds to claim that it was she who healed him, that she got her powers from Satan, and that she will kill him for expressing doubt. He leaves the confessional and finds the penitent side to be empty, and is of course promptly killed by a Mary. Cluny comes to the church and finds the priest dangling like Judas. George can't make sense of why someone miraculously healed would off himself, but the archbishop is like, oh what? I guess we'll proclaim it an accident, priest committing suicide is a kind of a no-no. In the Archdiocese, if you don't know what an Archdiocese is, it is a lair of the Archbishop, Clooney expresses his doubts to Alice, and Alice tells him that a Mary is none other than the Mother of God, showing us that she is unaware of the true nature of the visions, and that she is merely suffering from prelestitis and isn't actively malicious. While reviewing the interview, some pixels are a bit off, and then they jump scare poor George. Wow, that witch is really trying to let her true nature be known, isn't she? <laughs> During the funeral, George convinces Natalie that they should go to the church archives and... Oh, come on, there is an identical scene to this one in The Nun, which was released just three years before this one. Anyway, they find the same notebook the priest has. Sadly, it is in Latin. Good luck, Natalie knows Latin! It discusses burning of a witch. Can you guess what was her name? Come on, try to guess. Just try it. Imagine what would be the name of a witch. Do it. Come on, I dare you. So the notebook basically explains that the witch, called Mary Alnor, claimed that the Virgin Mary spoke to her and if you pledge your soul to her, she could heal you. But if you oppose her, you would meet tragic death. In the end, the town fought back and the witch was drowned in that creek. Wasn't she burned at the beginning of the movie? But before that, a mask was put on her face so she would forever bear the visage of the Holy Virgin. Wow. What is the purpose of the mask and imprisoning her in the current baby? Just banish the thing to hell. You know we have a dedicated place for demons, we don't need them anywhere else. During the funeral, Alice under Mary's prompt tells everyone that, because it is the eve of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, there should be a service dedicated to her at the shrine. Naturally, in the basement, one of the covered statues turns out to be a Mary, and in one of the briefest and silliest chase scenes ever produced, both Natalie and George manage to flee. They run after Alice to warn her, but due to all the press, they miss her. Oh, if there were only cell phones in this cinematic universe! The two of them reach the Archdiocese and confront the Archbishop as regards to the witch killings. It turns out that the Archbishop knew about it, but simply attributed it to 200-year-old superstition. If there really was a satanic witch that killed a bunch of people and the Archdiocese didn't speak out about it, it would be the second worst thing that the Archdiocese of Boston ever did. Be it as it may, the Monsignor Inquisitor was not informed of this case, and George is clearly showing that he's in it for the truth this time, not fame or money or prizes. Sadly, as the Archbishop points out, if he publishes the truth, who would believe a failed news reporter? The nuns don't let Natalie see Alice. In the cathedral archives, George finds out that Mary birthed a child, which was adopted by a certain man bearing Alice's last name. He also finds out an interesting clause in Mary's satanic contract, that she will live as long as her descendants do. Suddenly, their conversation is cut off and we come to one of the most feeble-minded scenes I've ever seen in a horror movie, and that's saying a lot. A statue of the Virgin Mary in the archive starts to crack. Seeing that, and knowing you're being chased by a witch who really likes impersonating Mary, you A. Run away B. Scream for help C. Start praying for your dear life 
D. Start approaching the statue. George, being a horror movie protagonist, clearly goes for D. Suddenly, the monster Jnor barges in and starts exorcising the spirit, but she destroys his prayer book. Oh no, if only this veteran exorcist had some basic prayers memorized by heart. And to the movie's big credit, he actually does. He forces Mary to flee. You know, I was so surprised by this smart take that for the second I forgot that George was approaching the clearly demonic statue. So George explains everything to the Monsignore, explaining that they must interrupt the service at the shrine. If everyone expresses their faith in a Mary, their soul will be consigned to hell and a Mary will grow even stronger. You know, after 2022, a powerful undead witch going around really wouldn't be the worst thing ever. So the Monsignor tries to exorcise the spirit while the service is underway at the shrine. He puts the current baby on the altar because, I don't know, they need it for some reason, I'm pretty sure that no Catholic rite of exorcism contains rubrics to use creepy dolls. So the Monsignor tries to light the candles, but Mary extinguishes them. You know, you sold your soul to the devil, you're a lich trying to increase your powers thousandfold, and you're reduced to blowing out matches. It's kind of sad. Mary clearly decides that these parlor tricks are below her and ignites a huge crucifix, which falls and impales the Monsignor. How? Well, you see, for the plot reasons, this crucifix has a very handy dandy Monsignor impaling spike at the top. George and Natalie are at a loss what to do, because they've lost their soul exorcist and Mary is growing stronger by feeding on people's faith. This gives George an idea. To simply destroy everyone's faith. In the tent, the Archbishop intones some mishmash of the Litany of the Saints and Kyrie Eleison, when he is interrupted by Alice who implores everyone present and watching to pledge their souls to the Lady of Banfield. They do it two times, but the third and most important invocation is interrupted by George and Natalie barging in. While George is telling the crowd that he invented the whole thing and that the cures of Alice and the little boy were placebo, Natalie is using sign language to make Alice snap out of it and realize that her Mary is an evil spirit. Natalie prevails and Alice tells everyone that the miracles were a hoax. This causes shock among the faithful and sadistic glee from scoffers watching online. The tree bursts into flames, Alice loses her voice and the little boy loses the ability to walk. The real Mary of Benfield erupts from the blazing tree. The Archbishop tries to exorcise her, but on account of him being a jerk that fails and she incinerates him. Mary chases George and Alice through the tent and tries to burn the journalist. However, Alice jumps in front of him and gives her life for his. With her last descendant gone, a Mary dissolves into cinders. George prays over her and there is a true genuine miracle. Alice returns to life. Praise the Lord! Wait, doesn't this mean Mary will come back too? Oh well! In the end, they all live happily ever after, with George being forever a disgraced journalist and having shattered people's faith. The end. On the third watching, I realized that the movie isn't all that bad. It certainly is bad, but it gives us some rather good moments. The prayer book scene, the prelast idea, the question of whether to destroy everyone's faith for the reason of saving them from demonic vision, the question of whether you do something questionable or immoral in order to give people hope and sense of purpose. I think that a lot of problems from this movie stem from four important points. First. The producers clearly loved the design of Mary so much that we are graced to see her all the time from all angles at full illumination. If she were kept more to the dark, she would feel much more ominous. Second, Mary Elmer is, simply put, an idiot. Like Mater Tenebrarum from Inferno, Mary is completely to blame for her own undoing. If she were more subtle, she could have fed on the faith of millions. But okay, I guess we can attribute the stupidity to Hoover's. Third, a lot of theological issues stem from the fact that Mary is undead. This makes next to no sense in Christian theology. If a proper demon was used, the movie would be more theologically sound, and probably even scarier because her attacks wouldn't be so physically crass. Fourth, while exorcism clearly affects Mary and God is active in the world, Mary is sure unbothered by all the Christian iconography, which is a bit of a contradiction. To be quite honest, I have no idea if this movie is anti-Catholic. Catholic prayers work, all of the protagonists are Catholics, but I don't know. Give me your thoughts in the comments below, I, I have no clue. Overall, it is a silly movie that has an occasional bright moment and tons of pointless scares. 
I give this movie 2 out of 5 false virgin marys. Bye!